Hey, this is Adam Pope, and you're listening to Chasing That Neon Podcast. You're fixing to hear a very cool interview with the incredibly talented and award-winning bluegrass duo, Darren and Brooke Aldrich. Darren and Brooke are not just one of the hottest acts in bluegrass music, but their kindness, authenticity, love for one another, and the heart they have for their audience and their great music is inspiring. Plus, they're from North Carolina, too. Since I'm a Tar Heel myself, I get pretty fired up about that. They've won multiple awards and topped the bluegrass charts many times. As a matter of fact, Brooke has been voted the IBMA Female Vocalist of the Year, not just once, but the last four years in a row, from 2017, 18, 19, and 2020. Darren, he adds that smooth, beautifully blended harmony, and I'll tell you, they'll just steal your heart plumb away from you. Some people sing and the audience melts. Then there's people who sing and legendary singers melt, like Jimmy Fortune of the Statler Brothers, Vince Gill, John Cowan, and many more. These dudes love to listen to and sing with Darren and Brooke Aldridge. Today I get to talk with them about their individual upbringings, their musical influences, how they met, and what it's like to have their musical dreams fulfilled right there in that famous circle on the Grand Ole Opry stage. Not just for the first time, but 25 times and counting. Every guest I have the honor of speaking with on this show brings something unique and uplifting to me personally. And hopefully that translates to y'all. That's the goal anyway. For Darren and Brooke, I think it's their excellence and their commitment to positivity in their songs, in their show. These traits are born out of hard work and an old-fashioned thing called character. They've got it. And I'm honored that I got to speak with them on this episode. Hey. Hey, hear me now. I can hear y'all. How y'all doing? We're good. We're good, yeah. Did y'all grow up in Avery County, North Carolina, or... I did, um, but Darren's, his whole family did. Um, His mom and dad moved away before him and his brother were born um, to Cherubal, where we live now. But, um, yeah, so he pretty much, he has deep roots there. We were in Burnsville one time, and they went in this little hotel right there on the square. Uh And uh, somebody told me, hey, have you seen uh, Elvis's room up here? And I said, what? And sure enough, they they showed me to a room that Elvis and Priscilla stayed in in the late 60s. Wow, that's something I didn't know. Yeah, and I, that blew my mind that of all places, they said he was looking to buy some property over there outside of Burnsville and ended up not doing it. But it's just kind of a, it's, it's like a folklore thing now. Like he stayed there one time, so they got the room decked out in Elvis stuff. It's pretty yeah. funny. To think Graceland could have been in Burnsville, North Carolina. <laughs> I know, yeah, of all things. But <laughs> definitely a prettier area than Memphis. I bet he was impressed, for sure. But Oh, we don't mean to knock Memphis on here, but um, anyway, <laughs> anyway, yeah, I, I love that love that area. But Darren, I read somewhere, you growing up, you were influenced by the uh, Beach Boys and Vince Gill, and, and is... Is that did you ever daydream back then of playing rock and roll and maybe uh country music before you went down a bluegrass path? I did. I I played all those type of things really before I started playing bluegrass. Oh, really? Yeah, my brother was several years older than me, about four, and his buddies would come over and play, you know, in the basement and garage band rock and roll and he was a drummer and he had some buddies that was guitar players and you know, I could change chords and stuff on the guitar, but I'd watch them and get into that kind of music, which was pretty much 80s hair band music at the time, you know, with Van Halen and, um, you know, Bon Jovi and Poison and all that stuff. So I learned all that kind of stuff on the guitar before I ever started playing bluegrass. Wow, cool. But singing, you know, and stuff, I remember early as a kid, five, six, seven years old, listening to the Beach Boys and, and the movie La Bamba had come out, and uh, that really took a hold of me. You know, I loved that type of thing with Richie Valens and mm-hmm. but all that kind of music. And I dug into that, and then one thing led to another. You know, I bought a tape. I remember one time somewhere like Kmart or Maxwell, it was a Beach Boys and Jan and Dean tape. And 
I'd wear that stuff out and listening to that type of music and singing. And Dirty Dancing come out about that time too, and I loved all the music in that. And mm-hmm. That was all this fifties music. It was just a good good style of music, you know. So those yeah. were two of my blended things. And then my my mom sang and played piano very well and played in church. And her dad was an old time mountain music maker, and he played guitar and sang like Bill Monroe. He had a high tenor voice and and a little bit of harmonica and banjo and so that was always in my family, and it was what until about, I guess, 15 when I started playing more bluegrass. I met up with some guys in high school that had a little gospel band in their church and asked me if I could play banjo some. They knew I played guitar and knew I sang because I was in the chorus and in the band through middle school and high school. And one of these guys played in the in the high school band with me and said, won't you come to church with us and sing? And we're trying to start a little band. So I actually learned to play banjo um, messing around with those guys. Okay. Banjo player. And then later moved to, uh, to Manlin. But yeah, uh, back up on that, we always, my mom had a clogging team and taught clogging because she had uh, grew up in, in Avery County, like Brooke was saying. And uh, one of the clogging teachers there was in Newland and in Lees McCray. And they had a clogging team. So she had always done that. So she started a clogging uh, team of country kid cloggers here around Cherville, which a lot of people, you know, did that because no, nobody taught clogging in the area at the time. Yeah. So we always played and went to festivals and clogged and state fair and stuff like that. And, of course, bluegrass music is what we dance to mainly or, uh, you know, kind of a bluegrass type of style of country music, which – was what Ricky was doing at the time, you know, in the eighties, that kind of mid eighties stuff. And I remember dancing to, uh, uh, John Cowan singing with Mark O'Connor, you know, the old, uh, Sally Ann. We did a routine. Oh, wow. Stuff that (laughs) me being probably eight, nine years old was I to think, you know, one day I'll be in a, in a band with John Cowan, you know, it never, (laughs) you just don't think that way as a kid. Yeah on than I get to, you know, so it's uh, pretty cool. I had a lot of deep roots and, and a lot of different musical influences. And Of course, I studied saxophone when I got in the seventh grade and, and played up till high school with, with all the, uh, the orchestra and, and the marching band and all that kind of stuff and learned that style of music as well to read, you know, no, notation and charts and everything too, so. Wow, this is, this is why you're so good at at producing you just you've got all of this background this that's really amazing well, i love love music always have and uh and what makes it up you know and yeah it's a, or as you know just like today how much changes evolve with it with the recording with uh you know instrumentations and sounds and micing certain things all those type of things have i've been really intrigued with wanting to find out about and that goes way back to the Beach Boys, man. I, I remember seeing one of those documentaries early on. I actually rented it, I think, from a video store of them uh, being at Brian's house and recording and all that. And I was like, God, <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other side I didn't know anything about, you know. Yeah. Wow. A, vi- a video store, too, of all, <laughs> of all things. Yeah. It wasn't a blockbuster, but it was something <laughs> else, you know. Slick video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brooke, well, Brooke, what well, what about you? When you were growing up, what what were you singing? Because I I know you were singing in, in church and stuff, but um, what what was your what were your the styles that were influencing you? Well, um, yeah, I definitely was more of a church. You know, that's really where most of my music evolved. My family um, would meet at my grandmother's every Sunday, um, aunts and uncles and cousins, and you know, we'd eat and we'd sit around and talk a while, and then we'd sing a while and. Um, it wasn't really, we didn't play a lot of instruments, but we, we sang, you know, and that, that was really, I guess, where I learned to develop such a strong voice. A lot of people say I have a great mountain voice, kind of like Patty Loveless, and she mm-hmm. was somebody I loved listening to as a kid. Um, I was in a lot of local talent shows. My elementary school that I grew up in um, had a talent show every year until I was in the eighth grade, and uh, so that was always a big thing. My parents really saw early on that I had a, 
a knack for, I could catch on to words really quick and, you know, just after hearing it a time or two and pretty much know the whole song. Um, but I loved, you know, I loved the Isaacs. I grew up in church singing with my mom and my mm. sisters. I remember the Isaacs at a very young age and um, just thinking how amazing they were. But yeah, um, yeah my church that I grew up in in the mountains that I still go there, my pastor and his wife, I've been there for over 30 years and um they they ha- they could sing really well and the choir where I grew up they sang really well and um it, you know it it just always just kind of came natural I felt like I was always around it somewhere in my area that I grew up in uh the local community there just there was so many great pickers and singers um so it's, it's like I was just always surrounded by people like that um yeah. but I I loved Emmy Lou Harris and Dolly Parton and um, like I said, Patty Loveless was a huge influence. And I guess when my parents started putting me in the singing competitions, I was doing, you know, more country stuff. I did, uh, I did the trio uh, songs a lot, Emmy Lou, Linda and mm, yeah. uh, Dolly. And then of course um, I love Lord of Lynn, you know, just all those yeah. classic folks and, um, and then later on, I love the nineties country. I think Darren gets tickled at me because I think we can be going down the road if we're listening to any nineties country station. I think I know every song he knows them all. that comes on. Oh man. I, I'm right there with you, Brooke. I, I love that stuff. Yeah. Nineties country. I was actually thinking, so if you were, I don't know what years you were doing these competitions, but I, did you ever do the, uh, I, I used to hear at these competitions, people would take on Leanne Rhymes, that blue song. Yeah. Now, you know, I never attempted that song, but I usually did Cowboy Sweetheart. And her version, oh, I mean, I, yeah. I knew Montana's version, but Leanne Rhymes is probably the version that I, I loved the most growing up when I heard her do that. But yeah. The song Blue. And I remember driving to Nashville with my family one time. We were going to a competition at Lord of Lynn's Ranch. And uh, I think that song had just came out. And my parents and my aunts and uncles were like, Oh, this is your next song. You know, you've got to learn this. You're going to win all these competitions. If you... <laughs> but I learned Cowboy Sweetheart instead. And uh, that one that one took me a long way in competitions as well. And we still do it to this day. And it really does always get a great crowd response. Well, I was going to say, I've seen y'all do that one. So I, I've, I've, jumped to my feet a few times on that one so that's that one's great <laughs> thank you yeah that well that's awesome and you won a bunch of those didn't you win like 20 or 30 of those things that are yeah over over 30 probably as a kid wow. you know and, and i'm grateful to my parents for for you know encouraging me to be in those because there were times when i didn't want to do it but you know they would just keep encouraging me and um i, I really i learned a lot of songs that way and a lot of different musical styles and how to play, you know, a, a, with a band kind of behind me too. Cause sometimes we use like, you know, the karaoke stuff. And then sometimes it was just with the band that they had at the, at the venues where I would go be in these competitions. But, um, you know, I won, I won college scholarships and some savings bonds and things like that, that really helped me get, you know, my college degree before I ever really set out to be, uh, a musical artist, which I always wanted to do, but my parents encouraged me to to finish school first too, just in case, you know. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it seems like it worked out the <laughs> for sure there. So, Thank you. and, and where, where, if you don't mind me asking, where did you go to school? Um, I grew up in Avery County, like we were talking about earlier, and there was one high school there. Um, it was called Avery High School, yeah. and then. I went to Brevard College for a year and I played volleyball. I was also really athletic. So I, I played just about every sport through high school that I think I could. If it was that season, that's what I was usually playing. Yeah. And, um, and then I went on to Appalachian State to, to finish my degree there in Boone. So. Wow, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, how did y'all cross paths, you and Darren? Well, being from Avery County, um, both, uh, well, I say me more so than Darren, but he had deep musical, you know, a, a deep heritage there and roots. My cousin went to high school with Brooke. She was a few years younger than oh, Okay. School. And probably played maybe volleyball the one year or basketball one. Mm-hmm. And my, both my, all three of my uncles lived around Newland. So anything Brooke was doing in the community that at that time, you know, they would, uh, my aunt would tell me, 
you know, about this young lady and how pretty she was and how good she could sing and I should meet. And <laughs> my great aunt went to church with her uh-huh. and told the same thing. And actually the the couple that was her pastor and his wife, they're actually like my third cousins. Okay. So all folks were singing and doing all that she was talking about were related to me on my mom's side. So my great aunt would always tell me and my mom about about Brooke as well and then they would do the same to Brooks like we know this this guy he plays with a bluegrass band you know that's legendary called the country gentleman yeah and you know he's from Avery County or his mom and dad is and y'all need to meet so we emailed I think for the first time but it was a couple years later before we actually met Mm -hmm. each other but I remember talking to her through like an email Somebody introduced us, and then we, we went back and forth just a little bit, and just about music things, talking. And then a friend that's of both of ours, we knew very well, that played in the band with Brooke at the time, had asked me to come up and fill in for their mandolin player. He couldn't make it to one of the church gigs that they had. I don't know if I'd come do that. So I was thinking, yeah, I can go play, and I can also meet Brooke. So this is a... <laughs> Win win for me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. And uh so that's what that's what kinda happened that morning. We met in church and played and uh ended up only one standing on the front pew, you know, at that morning before the service. And yeah. Asked her that was going on into Tennessee, somewhere around Elizabeth and I think the same that evening and I asked her, I said, Well, I'll go if you want me to go. <laughs> nice. And I put her on the spot. If, oh if, yeah. Uh, if, I, if you know she wanted me to go, I'd go. If not, I was coming back to the house. <laughs> well, it's pretty clear at that point either she wants you to or not. I mean, she's going to let you know. <laughs> uh, I so, wanted him to go. I, I did ask him to come. Yeah, so. yeah. So, and from there, it just the uh, rest is history, man. Oh <laughs> man, yeah, absolutely. Well, that sounds like that. That that's one of the. That's probably the most productive gig you ever played there, Darren, I'd have to say. I believe it was. It's yeah, worth yeah that, that turned out good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, how, hey, how did you, not to jump backwards here, but how, how did you uh, end up on the road with Country Gentlemen? I mean, that's amazing. Man, I was, I was doing all I could playing when I was my last year, <clears throat> year of high school. And I was playing in every good band that was in this side of North Carolina that needed somebody. And I was also just, it started traveling with acoustic syndicate at that time too. And, um, they went off to do a a new England tour and I didn't really want to go. I was playing some other things. I played with them for about a year on and off. I was playing with some local bluegrass bands and whatnot. I ended up, um, to skip forward a little bit. I went to the Spigma Bluegrass Convention there in Nashville mm-hmm. with and competed in the band competition. And it was from a lot of local, you know, buddies from Western North Carolina pretty much that had played. And we finished maybe in the top three or something. But a couple of the guys there, um, we played on Sunday. And I think the country gentleman was playing that evening, maybe for the awards or something. So, you know, how you've been there. Yeah. Uh, they set up the record table out there just outside of where the bands were playing. So a couple of the, the gents, Greg Corbett and Ronnie Davis, heard me playing in there and uh, and singing. And so when I come out through, I stopped to, uh, to speak to a lot of folks because uh, uh, one of the guys that had played with me in the band, he knew the mandolin player that it was just going to leave or something like that uh, because he was from North Carolina too. His name is Matthew Allred. And uh, so we introduced each other, and Greg asked me about it. He said, now, you live in North Carolina? And I said, yeah. And Greg was from Troy, North Carolina, which was, uh, you know, over there below Winston. Mm-hmm. And he found out I was from here. So he got my number. And uh, another guy was playing, I think, at the time. Matthew had just left to go to Jim and Jesse. And a guy named uh, Jeff Davis was playing. Uh, for a short while there, and then he he moved on to go with Mountain Heart uh, when they formed that band for just a little bit. So toward the end of that year, Greg called me and asked me if I was still interested in playing. So 
at the, uh, I think, 1999s when I started with the gentleman. And, and I drove down to, to near Troy. There used to be a place you might be familiar with called LEA's or Music Barn. Oh, and man, I don't, I don't remember that. that. The gentleman was playing there, and uh, it was down below Denton every year. And he asked me to come down there and, and try out with him. So I got up on the bus with, with Charlie and the gang, and I kind of learned a lot of that old material that was standard for the gents, you know, Matterhorn and Redwood Hill and Rebel Soldier. He asked if I could play Rawhide and sing Waltz of the Angels, and I played four or five other songs with them. And if I could do that, you know, they said, we think you'll fit this fine. Wow. <laughs> so I played six songs for audition. and <laughs> Next gig, you know, was here in a couple of weeks take these records right here and learn them we know them already <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i, I, I reckon so before then because two of them lived in virginia and me and greg lived in north carolina so yeah i think played a little bit before sound check and did our my first gig just right on the fly what led to that that would have even fell into your lap but without you being out there on the road saying yes to everything yeah, that had a big part. I had a, and and still like to think that I do. I have a, a always had a drive for the music and and what you might needed to do to do that. You mentioned Vince, you know, early as an influence and yeah. And about fifteen or so, uh, I heard him on the Opry, and I knew right then I wanted to be something like that. You know, I heard him play in his country band, then come out there with just a guitar and sing a gospel song on the Opry. Uh, I, I used to videotape all the Opry's that come on on Saturday night because if somebody come on there that I liked, you know, I would sit and study that videotape and listen. And that's really how I learned to play mandolin. Wow. Uh, yeah. The guy that I was in that I mentioned a while ago, I played banjo and guitar and Skaggs come on there one night and did one of the quartets, you know, just guitar and mandolin. I wanted to do that because we was a gospel band and, uh, I went upstairs and had that videotape and listened to that. And I told that guy that was playing with us, and I said, "We it kicks off on the mandolin. And it, at that time, the mandolin player we had could only play in A and in D. And if it was in B or E, he used capo, which was a no-no, you know. Yeah, oh, yeah. He was learning a good bit, too. Well, this song was in G. He had never played it in G, so I never played the mandolin, so I just – I said, well, let me see if I can figure it out. I took it from him. And I went upstairs and put that video on and figured out the kickoff. And <laughs> I'm like, where the band was, and I showed it to him, and I said, "This it goes like this, you know. And he said, man, you just play it on the man and let me play guitar. So that's how I started playing that. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> wow. When y'all met, how early did y'all know you had something musically to get? I mean, was that, was that the first one of the first conversations when y'all were going out, like we're going to, we're going to go out on the road together or did that just kind of come on down the road? Uh, what, comes, yeah. Um, I guess maybe six months or more. Mm -hmm. We've been playing cause she had a band at that time. And, um, with a lot of folks, a couple of them she went to church with and a couple of them that lived in the area, you know, around Spruce Pine and Newland. And, I was still with the Circuit Riders at that time. I don't know if you're familiar with that band that I was in after Charlie died. Oh, but no, I'm not. I was with those guys, and um, when we was free and wasn't playing a weekend, as Brooke and them would play, and I would go show up and sit down with them or help them run sound at a church or, you know, play a second guitar or whatever it was, and then – a few things started coming my way and I started taking Brooke out and putting some other musicians together with that to play some local type of gigs. Mm -hmm. And when she would come with me after we started dating a little bit, when I had a circuit rider gig, she would go with me and then we'd get her up to sing. And then, you know, the crowd would go wild <laughs> with her singing and uh, yeah, her singing some duets together. So, I think it kind of hit us both at the same time. You know, we've really got something that's outstanding and a lot better than what the situation that we're in right now. Yeah. And had the same goals and passion for music and 
and what we wanted to go forward in life. And it just, you know, the Lord put us in each other's lives and in place to go forward with. And that's what we got behind. Wow. That is a, uh, it's a divine union right there. <laughs> well, I feel like that's why we have so much in common with you and Amy too. You yeah. know, I feel like we have a similar story. Yeah. You know, it's funny when you're talking about meeting at church, that that's how, I mean, Amy and I actually met because of our church friends. We were in the same circle of friends, uh-huh. but I didn't, we, it, at the time she had a, had a boyfriend and, um, you know, I, we sort of, you know, just were acquaintances. Time went on like a year or so and my buddy was going to the church that she was at and he had a girlfriend over at this church where it's actually Cornerstone here in just north of Nashville. And um, I, I believe the Isaacs are there pretty regularly singing. I, I don't know if they go there, but I, I've seen them there quite a few times. Okay. Um, so at, when you're talking about the Isaacs, I started thinking back to when I first started dating Amy. I was going over to that church. They had a Saturday night service, and I had a church I'd go to Sunday morning. But boy, I was a church going fella because I would go Saturday night, and I'd have to, I have to admit it was because Amy was over there. <laughs> so I was I was doubling up on church, but I I, I knew uh, I kind of I kind of had a different goal. I was I was wanting to see if something came of it, you know, with me and Amy, and and uh, finally one day I went with her family. We we went up to Cracker Barrel, so it, it that's what kind of got things started for us. So. Adam, every now and then you just gotta you just gotta see what the Lord leads, don't. You? I know it. That's it. Was definitely <laughs> the Lord leading me over there. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. So um, you know something y'all are well known for, and I enjoy listening to your. I mean, first we're gonna talk about your originals here in just a minute. But y'all are known for picking the the perfect cover song, and and what I mean by that, you know, there's those. The ones, there's songs that are overdone, and then there's songs that just come out, and they're a cover, and they sound fresh, and they and y'all do it, and it sounds like a Darren and Brooke song. I think well, one, a great example is, one of my favorite examples y'all do is Someday Soon. You know, the other Teach Your Children Well is another one I, lo- I love that y'all do. Um, are you actively on the lookout, like when y'all drive down the road, are you listening for the perfect cover song, or they just happen to just have like when you do them live it just sort of you know after a while i mean how what's your process of picking a good cover song well sometimes it it happens like that like driving down the road and one comes on the radio and you think man you know that's that's not been done in a long time and you know we feel like certain songs like someday soon of course resonate with so many people um because it's been it's been around for so long it's been such a classic song and teacher children has to um but Someday Soon was a song that Darren and I always loved growing up. And remember hearing our parents play those records. Um, but we hadn't really ever sung it out live. And we would just sing it sitting around here in the living room. Yeah. But we were in one weekend down in Sarasota, Florida. And the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band had come by to see their buddy John and meet us, which was a huge honor. Um, wow. And John was going to get him up to play on a couple songs. <clears throat> and uh, we were actually in the middle of sound check when they came in. And so they stopped and listened while we were doing sound check. And um, John, John Cowan said, well, are you guys going to do that song tonight? You know, and Darren and I both were kind of like, well, not really, probably, you know, we were just kind of warming up for, for fun. Um, and then all the nitty gritty guys said, well, you guys have to do that song tonight. You know, we want to come up and play on that one with you guys. And so that's kind of how that song evolved. John kind of helped uh, with the arrangement on the one part that I hold out the long note there uh, on the chorus when I come back in. But yeah, um, yeah I mean, that song has, has definitely been a, a great song. It's one of those songs that we go somewhere now and we, we can't get out of the show without doing it, you know? Oh, for sure. It's, Y'all kill it, and 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 now John Cowan, he's I, when I met y'all, it was 2013 at Music City Roots, mm-hmm. and he was playing with y'all at on that show, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. I thought he, I think he was there, and uh, y'all toured with him quite a bit, haven't you? 
Yeah, his band was there. I don't. He wasn't on the. We weren't co billed together. Yeah, I think his band was playing, and then we were playing. And, yeah. I got you. Okay, that's why I put y'all together on that. Okay, how did y'all end up touring together? Because you've done quite a few shows together over the years, right? Yeah, we actually toured together for about on and off for about four years. Wow. Uh, and John. We went to see him at Acoustic Stage over here in Hickory one time, and he got us up to sing with him. Um, he had heard about us. Shad Cobb was in the band, and Shad knew of us, and I'd been around Shad a few times. You know, some friends of mine was friends of his, and we jammed some around Nashville and stuff. And He had told John, you know, what a good singer Brooke was, and so we got up and sang with him. But I'd been around John quite a bit there used to be a place over here in rutherford county uh called green acres and i would go there and see him and sam play together a lot it was after newgrass though i never got to see newgrass revival live but when sam put the band together with john and and uh daryl scott and larry adam Anu, i saw them play there a couple of times and then when i was with the syndicate john had put his band together for the first time I was and got to meet and be around it. But one thing to another, I was a big Cowan fan, big Newgrass fan of all that kind of music and really studied that. So after we sang with him in uh, acoustic stage, he talked to us later and he talked to his manager, Brian Smith, which now manages us. And he told Brian that, you know, we'd be a good fit for him. And I'd actually reach out to Brian maybe a year or so before that, you know, asking him to work with us and stuff like that. So, yeah. Oh, and it actually kind of nudged Brian and said, you know, I heard him saying this weekend was around him and there, that might be something that you want to jump on. And he said, you know, I've got that show over there in Shelby at the Don Gibson booked Cowan had. And he said, I'm thinking about just asking Darren Brooke to do it with me because he didn't have a band at the time. Um, when he went back with the Doobie Brothers full time, he kind of lost the Cowan band with Jeff Altry and Shad and those guys that had played with him all the time. They had to go get other jobs. So he was kind of in between and he knew he was from this area. And, you know, it was a good draw for him and us both. And it was a, a big theater over here called the Don Gibson Theater. And yeah. Come over and we practiced the night before and it, everything really clicked, you know. He had learned our material, and we'd learned his material and Newgrass stuff. But the singing is what really grabbed us all three because it was just powerful, you know. Oh and, yeah. Um, from then on, it's like, well, we need to do this more and more. And then our, you know, manager started working on it and started co-billing these shows together. And it, you know, four years later, and we recorded some music together also, and it was just a great thing. You know, and it's a dream come true for me because I just loved Newgrass forever mm -hmm. since I'd started playing that kind of style of music. You know, I was always a little, I don't know, some cause of the earlier rock influences that I'd had, you know, and stuff, but that really spoke to me. So, yeah, it's a thing, man. And John's a, a great musician, a, an excellent bass player, and he's such a humble guy to be as, you know, talented and just one of the best singers on the planet that you can be around. Well, y'all, uh, y'all blend so well. So I, I love it when y'all are playing together. No doubt. Um, who played steel guitar on teach your children? Well, for that was Tommy white from, uh, the Opry staff band. Okay. Yeah. Whites and played on a bunch of recordings in the pedal steel hall of fame. And when we've been doing the Opry a lot, we, Tommy always plays with us most of the time. And we just asked him to come over there to the session that day. And he'd be perfect because I know when the, it was cut by Crosby, Stills, and Nash, uh, Jerry, you know, played uh, pedal steel on that from the Grateful Dead. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow, I didn't know that. Jerry, Jerry Garcia. Yeah, Garcia played the pedal steel kickoff and break in that. So... I'd first heard it actually from Charlie and them doing it. The country gentleman who recorded it in the late sixties as well. And, uh, so that's another tile that I wanted to record it on this record. Plus it was 
like you say, it hadn't been done in so long in a type of bluegrass and country way. I thought it would be a good fit for us. And um, so we had to record it with steel, so we got Tommy to come in and do it. I love how connected y'all are with roots, and yet it you're not trying to repeat the old. I mean, you're, you're doing your thing, but y'all really are so aware of the who's played on what, who did what, who wrote what, you know, y'all have that, that real respect and, 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 uh, you value those things and it really shows in your, in your craft. It's, it's impressive. Well, thank you so much, man. We just, like yourself, just love that kind of music and, and all music really. And, and why it's become what it is, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you've got a lot of great original songs. I mean, I, I've always loved, I mean, every time y'all do Someone's Everything, that song, I mean, that's Amy and my, that's our favorite that y'all do. Um, could could you tell the story on that one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, this song was inspired by a, a, a teacher that I had in high school, and she was just somebody that I, I knew growing up as a kid, too. Um, my younger siblings, or my older siblings had her uh, when they were coming up in school, but Gwen Clark was her name and she's, she's just always been such a huge influence in our community. And, um, you know, she always had such great words of advice and wisdom. And I was scrolling through Facebook one day as we were driving down the road and she was, she had put up a post for her son who was fixing to graduate college and he was going to be a school teacher himself. And, uh, I worked in the school system for 10 years as a teacher as well. So I guess I kind of related to it in what she was telling him, um, but she just told him, you know, as he set out to to start his first day of teaching, to remember that no matter what kind of day he was having or the kids were having, that they were someone's everything. And that just kind of stuck with me. And I thought, I've got to write that, you know, at some point. So I mentioned it to Darren and um, we kind of sat down and um, I had pretty much already came up with the words and he helped me with the melody. And that's kind of that's kind of how that came to be. I got to sing it for Gwen just before she retired. Um, at the high school and she still keeps in touch to this day and uh still continues to inspire me with her words of wisdom so yeah who never know when i might come up with another song and get to dedicate that to gwen again because she's just been such a huge impact in my life and and i'm thankful for that you know i, I grew up in a, in a small town in a community where everybody was always so supportive of me and my dreams and what i wanted to do and just encouraged me along the way and i think they're a big part of why I get to do what I do. Absolutely. Well, I mean, that's that song. It's um, it's got so much heart in it, and I, you know, well, I've wiped a tear out of my eye a time or two when y'all were playing that one. So, it's a good one. Oh, thank you. I, I hear I hear the puppy dog now and then. What, what what you got over there? What what's the dog's name and what, what kind it, of? His name's Otis, and he's a Yorkshire Terrier. He's about thirteen years old now. Oh uh, man. Darren and I got him, uh, I got him, I guess it was close to Mother's Day, the same year that Darren and I got married in 2008, and uh, and he's been our little companion um, all these years. He's starting to have some some uh, arthritis and hip, hip issues, but he's... Ain't we all? He's, <laughs> <laughs> so we hope that he'll, he'll have a lot more life in him, but uh, yeah, he, he sings with us sometimes on our Sunday shut-in shows. And uh, and everybody's kind of come to love him, you know, and expect to see him when we when we get online. And we've actually taken him to our Christmas show that we do here in uh, Kings Mountain, North Carolina, not too far from Cherryville. Every year, um, yeah. he gets does one song with us, and usually always steals the show. You know how that is with the, with puppies and kids. So. Oh, I know <laughs> it for sure. Well, y'all Sunday shut in has has become a big deal. I mean, y'all started that last, was that last March? Uh huh. Yeah. And, and I mean, y'all, you can't, you haven't been able to do every Sunday as far as I know, right? But you've been able to keep it up quite a bit. Yeah, we're, we've done them at least twice a month. It, we might have been one time a month here, like this year. Yeah. But most of the time we've done it for, for a long time during last year. We did it about every Sunday when, when everybody was really, you know, shut in at home, stuck at home. That was probably up until about August or July. Yeah. I did them about every week there for a while. And uh, 
it was just a great way to interact with with our fan base and family and friends and other people and and it reached us a lot of uh, new fans also yeah no doubt and you know speaking of performances uh, y'all just played the opry for the 25th time is that right 25th we did yeah, that's right that was our official uh, 25th that, uh, friday night Wow. So what was it like from the first time you walked out into the circle there to this last time? What did you feel like you had more nerves this time or less? Oh, I feel I feel the same nerves every time. <laughs> really? So it's always like the first time. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's such a, you know, it's it's one of those places that I know so many people love and appreciate because, you know, just through the years it's always been there. It's always been a beacon of hope for so many people. Um, um, yeah. And so, I mean, it's just so surreal to step out on that stage every time and it, it goes by so quick. Um, you know, you'll usually get two or three songs, but it feels like it's over in just a matter of minutes. And, um, just, it's an absolute dream come true to, to know that you've dreamed about playing a place like that since you were a kid and, uh, hearing about it and watching it on TV and listening to it on the radio. Um, there's just, there's no other feeling like it really. You seem at home out there, and you you definitely belong out there. So that's that's exciting that y'all have done it that many times. And and uh, you know, I I, th- I, th- I think about as we're talking how full circle it is because every about, uh, almost all the heroes that y'all have mentioned that you were looking up to, you know, and Darren, you were talking about literally videoing the Opry and studying the the singers on there. I mean, how full circle is that when you get to do a duet with Vince? Yeah, it's it's very, you know, we feel very blessed to get to do what we do and to meet the folks that we've had, the folks that we've looked up to so long. And, you know, they became friends of ours now and, you know, just talk about other things besides music and get to know them so well, just like Vince and, and Ricky and, you know, several more that... Uh, you know, we studied under and listened to for so long. It's, it's been, like you say, a complete circle to, to be out there and be treated like family and to get to sing. You know, one of our special moments was, you know, the other week when we sang y'all song uh, on there, just the two of us. And we also did a nice duet for our 12th anniversary at mm. the Rhyme year before last, wasn't this year? Yeah. The year before that. And that was very special. To, to stand there, just the two of you, you know, and sing to a full house at the, the Mother Church. You know, it's pretty special. Yeah, and to know that, you know, Darren and I both, before we ever knew each other, we both had those dreams of, of getting to play the Opry at some point. And, you know, as a kid, I'm sure you were the same way, Adam. You, you hear your whole life, you hear older people say, well, you need to go to Nashville. You go to Nashville and you make it. You know, if you get to play the Grand Ole Opry, you've made it, you know. Um and times are different, but like to us, it's still, it's still, that's what rings in our ears. And that's what we feel in our heart is that we've, we've made it, you know, because we, that's what we've dreamed about our whole lives. Does that make sense? Oh <laughs> my gosh. Absolutely. I mean, I, I feel that for y'all. I, and, and we, we're excited to see that happen to such great people. I mean, there y'all are obviously you have all the talent in the world for it it but to see it happen to such great people at the same time and you know that the door continues to stay open and and the, and the lord y'all bring a very loving positive energy to every stage you step on and to see that in the world that we live in today to see that find a, a it's home, you know, uh, find a stage on the Opry and the biggest country music and bluegrass stage in the world, most, tr- you know, the, the most historic. And there at the Ryman at the Mother Church, it, it gives a lot of people hope. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, when we started out in our music, um, that's what we set out to do was, was to have a positive and uplifting kind of message. And, and most of the songs that we chose, um, because we saw... You know, we saw so much neg- negativity starting to come into our world. And, um, you know, it, there's not hardly a day that goes by that or a week, at least, that we don't get an email from somebody saying thank you so much for, for the music that you put out there and for encouraging, you know, people like us 
uh, to to always remember that love is, is important and, uh, you know, keeping the positive spirit and the uplifting message. So that's, that's what we've, we've tried to stay grounded in. And, um, and we feel like we, we've done that. <laughs> no, you have. And you, no matter anytime you're at a Brooke and Darren show, y'all are going to be smiling. The crowd's going to be happy. It doesn't matter what's going on outside that venue. And y'all, y'all bring that to the stage and you have consistently as long as you've been doing it. And I, I think that's that's amazing. That's that's true professionalism, but it's also your hearts. It's not hard. It, from what I can tell, it seems like it's just who y'all are when you get up there. And it's also who you are when you walk off the stage, too. And that's the testament. That's a t- true testament to your character. Absolutely. You know, that's I think that's what people need these days is are people that are real and, you know, um, that's that's how we always hope we come across because that's really how we are. <laughs> yeah, well, for sure. And the other thing about your shows, and I I've, I love seeing y'all at the Station Inn. I just love the Station Inn in general, uh-huh. and I think obviously a lot of people do. And I noticed that y'all can, you, you cover all these different flavors of bluegrass and acoustic mu- music. You know, you can softly push those traditional limits, cross over into country, and then next thing you know, y'all just take off and you're picking a number that make old Bill Monroe just proud to know you, you know? <laughs> and and I, I always, at the end, at the end of the show, at the end of the day, y'all are reflecting those traditional values we just talked about and your bluegrass roots. Is that a conscious effort to kind of do all those different things? Or do y'all just go in thinking, let's just do great music and you're not really making a specified effort to go close to the rails over here or close to the rails over here and then get back in the middle? Like, how do y'all approach that? Does this question make any sense? It does. And it's just, basically we look at it as just making great, great music, you know, and it's music that's a part of us and what we love and what we want our audience to hear and feel just like what you're saying. But uh, we hope a lot of people do. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Well, well, what's next? I mean, you've got, You've got a new single out that's doing really well, um, Blue Baby Now. And mm-hmm. and what what about, um, you know, uh, when's your new album coming out? The new album will be out uh, 1st of August. August 1st. Oh, all right. Another uh, single out sometime in this summer, maybe in June. Nice. We've more original songs on this album. I think we're going to have five or six on there. Um because the pandemic was at home more, you know, did more things here. We had more time on our hands, so we wrote a lot more tunes and co-wrote, you know, a bunch of songs. So we was able to pick, and the theme-wise of what fit this record, five or six, I guess, what it really mm-hmm. put on here. Yeah. yeah. So it's was real tickled about that. We've put two or three on some in the past, but this will be the most that we've ever put of original music for Darren and Brooke. Well, I'm glad but to hear that. We've got, That's good. Uh, Having more gigs starting to fill in now that restrictions are a little better, and some festivals are starting to come back, and you know live shows are starting to come back instead of just everybody using a videotape or a phone to look through. Yeah. So I'm thankful for that, and uh, several more things coming. We've got two or three a month right now, and I think we're supposed to come back to the opera, you know, later on this spring, and. Uh, just looking for better days ahead. Well, they're coming. They're coming for sure. <laughs> but, well, we need to down and right with you sometime, Adam. Y'all have a lot of great stuff going on, but if we ever work that out, that'd be a great honor. We'd love it. Yeah, uh, we'd love it. Well, thank y'all for doing this with me. I sure appreciate it. Thank you. It's been fun. It's uh, felt like a great conversation with an old friend. Well, I appreciate it. I mean, I think, I think if, uh, I think our roots and the way we see the world is pretty lined up. So it, I think we are old friends. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well, hey, y'all, y'all have a great night and uh, tell Otis we look forward to seeing him sometime down the road. <laughs> All right. Sounds, Sounds good, good, Adam. Thank you so much. All right. Thank y'all. Talk to you later. Bye.